Hello friends, welcome to what is likely going to be the last Cal 2 video for quite a while. This video is going to focus on taking a very powerful look at surface area. I'm going to give you guys a powerful integration formula for surface area, just like I did for arc length. But to build up to that formula requires talking about a three-dimensional object shape called a frustum. What is a frustum? It's simple. You just take a right circular cone, any horizontal band on it that you see there in yellow, that's a frustum. So that yellow thing right there is a frustum. It's a band. And you can think of it as being generated by a big cone, subtracted away, subtracting away a smaller cone somewhere above it, some arbitrary amount right above it. So the lateral surface area, the amount of space that frustum takes up, is going to be the lateral surface area, the amount of space the big cone takes up, excluding its base, that's why we're calling it lateral surface area, minus the lateral surface area of the small cone. Again, lateral for a cone means we're ignoring that circular base. We just care about the surface area on the sides. And there I'm shading my frustum in green, and of course this extends right around to the back. Over. Let's put some variables. R1, R2 are the radii of the top and the bottom circle of the frustum, so to speak. And the little length there, script L. Now I want to get a formula for this frustum lateral surface area. To do that, convince yourself that you can form any cone in existence by taking a sector of some circle and folding those sides. You see there are the purple arrow, connecting those two lengths, L and L, together and poof, it'll pop up. Think about like a sheet of paper. You fold that piece of paper right up against each other and you'll pop up a cone. Now, again, lateral surface area of the cone down below is equal to the sector area above. That's what you see there in green. And moreover, by construction, the way we've constructed this sheet of paper by moving L to L ensures that the length there in blue, the arc length of the sector, has to be the length of the circle down below in orange. It has to be the same length. So the length in blue you see there is just the circumference times theta over 2 pi. The length there in orange is just the circumference of that circular conical base, 2 pi r. So, same length. By construction, 2 pi r equals L theta, 2 pi r over capital L equals theta. Now, why did I do that? Well, how about I get an expression for area? The area of the sector, which we agree is the lateral surface area of the cone down below, the area of that sector, of course, is pi r squared times theta over 2 pi. R, in this case, is capital L. Cancel, cancel. 1 half theta L squared is the area of the sector, which has to be the same amount as the lateral surface area of the cone down below. So lateral surface area of the cone is 1 half theta L squared, but I don't want to define this in terms of theta because theta is, a, theta is a property of a sector of a circle, not of a cone. So I'm going to sub in for theta, 2 pi r over L, and I get the lateral surface area of any cone is pi times r times L. You may have seen this formula in the ninth grade geometry, um, but here's how you derive it. Let's apply this formula now to that small cone slash big cone picture. I'm gonna label X there. You see that from the top of the small cone to the bottom of the small cone, that's the lateral length and denoted by X. So the lateral surface area of a frustum is gonna be the lateral surface area of the big cone minus the lateral surface area of the small cone. And I get that expression down below algebraically. Simplifying just a bit, distribution, gives me this, but again, I want to have an expression of a lateral surface of a frustum in terms of just R1, R2, and L. I don't want X. X is not intrinsic to the frustum, so to speak. It's defined externally. So I want to get rid of that X somehow in my expression down below. Well, I notice that if I drop a pink, drop a blue line segment straight down from the, from the apex, I create two similar right triangles and via similarity we solve for x, like so, and plug it right on in. Plug it right on in, and we're going to do that algebra right up top. I have three terms. Two of them have rational terms. So my best bet is to make this one fraction for now. So that middle term, that second term, I'm going to multiply by 1 in a useful way, in other words, R2 minus R1 over R2 minus R1 gives me a common denominator. Let's make a bit of space here to algebraically gallop. 
and I distribute pi r2, distributed in the first term, pi r2l, distributed in the second term, and the third term, all over r2 minus r1. And notice, first term and third term on the numerator cancel each other, cancel out, and I'm left with this. Still looks like kind of a mess, but notice I can pull out a pi l, leaving me with a difference of squares. And when we see difference of squares, we immediately know that that thing is factorable. And aha, when I factor, some stuff is gonna cancel, top and bottom, and I'm left with an expression for the lateral surface area of a frustum, just in terms of those three quantities, R1, R2, and L. There it is. That's a common, a common way the lateral surface area of a frustum is expressed, but a more common way is like so, especially in calculus. Uh, Let's define the average radius, lowercase r, as just r1 plus r2 over 2. Just averaging the top radii and the, the bottom radii, so to speak. So then 2r is going to be r1 plus r2. In other words, lateral surface area of frustum is 2 times pi times r times script l. So again, be careful here, lowercase r is the average radius. 2 pi rl, 2 pi rl. That is what I'm going to utilize heavily in this next little section. Suppose I want to create a surface by revolving this smooth, continuous, differentiable function over the x-axis. So there I've created a nice vase by revolving that blue piece of the graph around the x-axis. And the goal is to find the surface area of that blue vase. Well, if I rotate the approximation path that you see in red, made of polygonal uh, line segments, called a polygonal path. Um, notice this polygonal path, but when I rotate it around the x-axis, is formed of six frustums. Six frustums. This is, this is why we focus so much on frustums, because each of those six things is a frustum. Now, do I know the inner and outer uh, radii? of each frustum? Well, yes I do. Each one is a function value of some kind. There you see me labeling my R1, R2, R1, R2. Of course I need to distinguish it better. Um, R11, R21 for the first sub-interval. They were in the, in the second one in green, 2, 2, 3, 3, third sub-interval, etc, etc. Now let's label the, the lateral lengths, L1, L2, L3, and so on and so forth, with uh, script L's. And each one is going to have the form of L1. L1, all I need to do for that is Pythagorean theorem, just like we did for arc length. So the lateral surface area of that blue vase is approximately the lateral surface area of all six frustums added together. So, 2 times pi times the average radius, so the first one, times Script L, script L1. And that's given to us by the Pythagorean theorem. The surface area of the second frustum is 2 pi times average radius times script L sub 2. Looks like so. And I do this all the way out to the sixth frustum. 2 times pi times the sixth average radius all times script L sub 6, like so. Now I want to condense this just a bit nicer. And I know that should have been a, a plus sign in that last radical. That's okay, I'll fix it up here. So, Building off of the algebraic moves we made in that arc length video, I can rewrite this as a summation and introduce some new uh, terms. So a delta x. The lateral surface area of the blue vase. In summation notation, 2 pi summation from 1 to 6 of average radius. 
times the square root of 1 plus that guy right there squared delta x sub i. So notice this is very, very similar to what we did in the arc length video. We just got an extra term, that average radius term in the summation. That's the only difference. It's the only difference so far. Um, oh, and, and, and of course, the 2 pi. Now, I want to note two things. First, I'm going to note that when you average f of x sub i and f of x sub i minus 1, that's going to be between, strictly in between f of x sub i and f of x sub i minus 1. Um, but we don't know for sure which one is bigger than the other. Uh, but which, whatever the case is, the average of two numbers is always in between those two numbers. And since f is continuous on the interval a, b, we know that there has to exist some x value in the interval x sub i minus 1 to x sub i for which that is true, for which the average of the two values is equal to the function value of some x coordinate in between x sub i minus 1 and x sub i. So I'm going to underline him there in blue, and I'll substitute him in in a second, right after I note a second thing. And this second thing is just what we did in the arc length video. As before with arc length, since we know that this function, again, it's a differentiable, smooth, continuous function, it's differentiable on AB, open interval AB, the slope of that secant line right there, connecting the two points, x sub i minus 1, f of x sub i minus 1, and x sub i, f of x sub i, has to equal f prime of x sub i, I double star, because I already use single star, for some x value, x sub i double star, inside that open interval, x sub i minus 1, x sub i. It's just the mean value theorem for derivatives. Um, and again, I, you had to use x sub i double star, because I already use x sub i single star for the average uh, that you see there on the right or the left. And it might not be the same x coordinate, right? They're probably not. In any case, I substitute those values in where you see the, the blue underlined term and the red underlined term. And I crisply compress the lateral surface of the blue vase into this much nicer looking summation. And from here, we employ the classic calculus move of limiting this thing as n goes to infinity. So the exact lateral surface here of the blue vase, that's why I'm using the color blue here. Two pi limit as n goes to infinity of the summation of x sub i single star times the square root of 1 plus f prime of x sub i double star squared all under the square root times delta x sub i. Now, I want to analyze this term here. Just as a note, the big note for now, x sub i single star and x sub i double star, that's the biggest difference um, visually from what we, uh, we saw in the last video for arc length. But notice that when our intervals collapse to zero, i.e. as n goes to infinity, i.e. the width of every sub-interval approaches zero, whatever x sub i double star and x sub i single star are, they're, they're going to have to approach each other. Because the widths are collapsing to zero. The rectangles are collapsing to zero. So x sub i double star approaches x sub i single star. So with that in mind, we can just simply now apply the definition of a definite integral. It doesn't matter that x sub i double star and x sub i single star were different. The definition of a definite integral still carries through. And this is my exact area, surface area, of the blue vase. It's that right there. 2 pi times the integral from a to b of f of x times the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. So very, very similar to the arc length formula. Just a couple of extra terms thrown in. The 2 pi and the function. Let's, uh, to illustrate how powerful this is, let's at long last prove why the area, surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, something we saw in ninth grade geometry. But we're never, we were never really able to prove it until this moment. So of course, classic move, generate a sphere by revolving a semicircle around the x-axis. Similar to what we did for the arc length video, start by taking your derivative 
bit of chain rule. Then I square him, so I get x squared over r squared minus x squared. And then I add one to him and simplify that expression. So one is the same thing as r squared minus x squared over r squared minus x squared. And the x squareds in the numerators cancel. So that is what I put inside my radical. So surface area, two pi times the integral from negative r to positive r of the function times the square root of one plus the derivative square. F of x is root r squared minus x squared. Inside the radical is r squared over r squared minus x squared. Throwing those things in gives me this. And notice I can break up that second radical into two. Square root of r squared on the top, square root of r squared minus x squared on the bottom, and look, cancellation party and simplification party. Our square root of r squared is r. r is a constant, I bring it out front, two pi r times the integral of a simple dx from negative r to positive r. There's an understood one there, of course, and this yields the formula for surface area of a sphere. How beautiful is that? We basically proved this using pieces of a cone. Everything we've been doing so far was based on that frustum formula at the very beginning. If what's a frustum? It's just a piece of a cone. It's just a nice piece of a cone, a horizontally oriented piece of a cone. Now, let's apply this formula to unfamiliar territory. What if I want to find the surface area of something rather exotic? Something never seen before until now. What if I want to find the area of the surface? formed by revolving x cubed, considered on the interval 0 to 1, about the x-axis. So there's my point, 1, 1, 0 to 1. Revolution, ooh, it's like a little horn, like an angel horn or a, or a jazz horn, whatever it is, quite nice. The surface area of that thing, of course, excluding the circular base, so to speak, the lateral surface area is given by this, 2 pi times the integral of the function times the square root of 1 plus the derivative squared yields this, and that integral is eminently tackleable, tackleable, uh, eminently amenable to use substitution. And here we are. Just to make the math a bit easier, I notice I can. Uh, Cancel the 2 over 36 is to be 1 over 18. The 9 and the, the 2 and the 18 make it a 1 9th. And oh, a 1 9th is, you know, there's a pi there, so 1 9th times 3, 27 on the bottom. Gives me this. That is the exact area, the exact surface area of that angel horn. This comes out as approximately 3.5632. Two, Three decimal places. Again, notice the theme of this video. We're using pieces of a cone. We used pieces of a cone called frustums to develop the powerful formula that we used to find the volume of the surface area of a sphere and the surface area of this angel horn. This is very powerful and it's also quite bizarre. It's quite bizarre. Even, uh, even Adam Sandler thinks so. Even he does too. This is quite bizarre. This is really bizarre. All right, guys, that's it for surface area. Quite a lovely topic.